Right, thank you for having me, and thank you for what you do. It's, I don't work directly with invasive species, and it's pretty impressive to hear all that is going on. I work for the Salish and Kootenai tribes, and I think if you look at the agenda, you might think you've got to be named Hanson to be hired by the tribes. <clears throat> it's not a prerequisite, but it, maybe it helps. And I believe Eric has donated his time to me today, so we'll go with that. And I'm, I'm very pleased to work for the tribes. They highly value native species. And I think, of course, it must come from generations with these native species and a close connection that a lot of us, especially of European descent, don't have that kind of history. So it, it really is amazing the importance they give to native species and therefore those of us working for the Salish and Kootenai tribes are in a very good position to do a lot of work for native species. And I think we can do things that wouldn't necessarily be possible in other jurisdictions. Also, it's, um, we do a lot of habitat restoration work, and we've been very successful. And I'd like to contrast that work a little bit with this invasive species concept that if you restore habitat and buy the, the land or ease the land, then typically your work is done and, and you can celebrate and, and rest and, and be happy with what you've accomplished. Our experience with non-native species is the work seems to never end. Bob just said that uh, there's, your charge is to work yourself out of a job. I'm afraid that's never going to happen. And also on the Flathead Reservation to date, we have stressed mostly efforts to suppress non-native fish. And we are considering piscicide programs, which would draw a little bit of a parallel with habitat restoration where you could do a treatment and remove that non-native and hopefully then be done with the job. So we look forward to possibly applying those tools elsewhere on the reservation, but mostly what I'm gonna to talk to you about today are our efforts to suppress non-natives. I'll give numerous examples initially across the reservation where we have these problems and then I'll stress in the last part of the presentation the major effort we do on Flathead Lake to suppress lake trout there. Okay, this is not a... Okay. I'm known to break these easily. <laughs> Okay, don't test me. So this is a, a list of our worst actors. And uh, as Bob described, I guess these are largely fish on fish problems. And they aren't, in our case, they aren't invasive problems. They were generally self-inflicted problems, either by agency planting or individual planting. For example, northern pike were planted on the reservation, the first plant in the state of Montana back in the 50s, and that was by an individual. Rainbow trout are pervasive on the res, and uh, brook trout also. Smallmouth bass are a more recent introduction, that was more of an accident. And mice's shrimp was an intentional introduction back in the 60s. And lake trout, a much earlier introduction. So I'll start with one of our worst examples. This is Mission Reservoir, a beautiful place that held an isolated population of bull trout. And we think brook trout were introduced in there in the 60s. And by the, uh, it was a small population and it sort of chugged along and an important population to preserve. But the brook trout we determined were hybridizing with the bull trout and those these are red counts indicated here. And by the mid-90s, that low red count exploded, relatively speaking, 
based on that hybridization. So we were measuring reds also from hybrid individuals. But it only took a couple of years for that hybridization process to eliminate those bull trout. So now they're exterminated from that system. This is one case where we may attempt to piscicide the whole system and reintroduce lake trout. But that native stock that was in that system is now gone from this non-native fish. Here is some work done by another of our biologists, Craig Barfoot, and this describes the historic range on the Flathead Reservation of West Slope cutthroat trout. And essentially, they were everywhere in all the waters. And today, they've been restricted by a long list of impacts, but certainly non-native fish is a big part of it. Both rainbow hybridization and brook trout competition. So now we have small populations that are not particularly strong, generally, in headwater locations. Here's a case, this is an example, another isolated population of West Slope cutthroat in a stream called Magpie Creek. And brook trout were introduced there, we think, in about the 60s. And it took a couple of decades for them to increase. The graph indicates the percent of the species composition that brook trout represent in this population. And by 2012, they were almost a quarter of the, popula of the assemblage there. And then Craig initiated an effort to suppress them through electrofishing. And that has been successful, but again, it's a major effort. It has to go on continually, and it's not over, it, and it probably never will. This may be a case where we might piscicide, but we've seen marginal success here. Smallmouth bass, that accidental introduction, are now in, primarily in the Flathead River. These are data of Craig's as well from the Flathead River where they went from their initial release to an explosive population level and now they dominate the system. And then when you get them in one water body, they tend to find their way to others, not necessarily through invasion, but through pocket biology. They're also in Flathead Lake now. We don't have any particular program to suppress these fish, but we do have unlimited bag limit on them, and suppression may be in the future. Okay, now I'll move to Flathead Lake and the work that we're doing there. And again, it's the same picture where it starts with species introductions. In this case, over 100 years ago, Lake Whitefish were put in, then Lake Trout. And by 1916, kokanee were put in. Kokanee were very successful and supported a very popular fishery for about five decades. But as is our way, it seems, it still wasn't good enough, so there was an effort to improve that kokanee fishery. And mice's shrimp were introduced into upstream lakes in the late 60s. They migrated down to Flathead Lake, where they had the opposite of the intended effect, and it resulted in the crash of kokanee in very short order, only in a couple of years did they crash. There was a lot of confusion over the biology. Was it competition with the food source for kokanee, or was it something like predation by lake trout, which we ultimately determined was the case. Kokanee fed the juvenile lake trout that formerly had been held back by a bottleneck in that life stage, their population exploded. And in short order, their predation on native fish resulted in the listing of bull trout by 1998. These are just some measurements taken, primarily in this case by Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, <coughs> to illustrate the rapid decline of native fish. These are adults as determined by red counts. A decline in the whale creek population. This is one of the 
premier spawning tributaries of the Flathead system and rapid decline after mysis and lake trout expansion. These are similar data of adult bull trout caught in a series done in Flathead Lake and also a radical decline. And then, no surprise now, but a little bit at the time, coincident with the decline of these native fish was the explosion in abundance of lake trout. And a lot of research followed that really indicated the extent to which lake trout were controlling native fish in Flathead Lake. This is the Flathead watershed, and it illustrates the importance of native fish that integrate the entire watershed. They migrate up through the North Fork and the Middle Fork, utilizing all the potential spawning tributaries. So their early life history is in the upper watershed, their adult life history is in the lake. So they, the impacts of lake trout are not just to the lake, it's to the entire watershed. The Salish and Kootenai tribes committed themselves to addressing this problem and went through extensive research, extensive public scoping, and in this case, it uh, culminated in this environmental impact statement that set our course to reduce abundance of lake trout adults by 75%. So that was a compromise with a variety of stakeholders, and it also illustrates this point I'd like to stress, for us anyway, that it was, this results in perpetual work to address this problem. It's not something we can fix. It won't go away. We have to commit ourselves to it in perpetuity. So I, <clears throat> what I want to show here is we laid out a target harvest for lake trout. And we did that through population modeling and population estimation <clears throat> to determine exactly what annual harvest would be necessary to achieve a 75% reduction of lake trout abundance. So we start with a, a standard estimate based on empirical data of what the public is harvesting independent of anything we do. We estimate that to be 25,000 lake trout annually. Then we implemented two key tools to reduce lake trout. Fishing contests, we call them MAC days, and gill netting. So we have fall and spring events both in both of these tools. This is the spring fishing contest. And it's been very successful, it's grown substantially, but you can see it plateaued. Then here are the the fall event, which is smaller than the spring, but it, it gets us closer to our goal. Our goal is over 140,000 fish, so it's not even on this scale at this point in time. Then we began gill netting in 2014, and this is our spring gill netting, which increased that further. And then this is the fall gill netting. So we're up over 100,000 fish now in our effort but we still have 30-some thousand fish to go, assuming that all of our modeling and population estimation is correct. Of course, a concern in any of these efforts is unintended consequences, and will the bycatch offset your gains? We have worked very hard to minimize our bycatch and have really been quite successful in this five-year period with a harvest of about 340,000 lake trout we've had less than 90 bull trout mortalities. So to do all this work, we've got to buy equipment and hire personnel. So first we started with a small boat. Soon it was, we realized it was insufficient to do the job. Then we bought another one. And the reality is we think we might even need another one, but this is where we are now. So we've got uh, two boats working on the water. We've hired a substantial crew and we continue to hire. And that crew has nice days to work out there and some not so nice days. 
today, they're out there, and I think it's this kind of a day. Then we also process most of the fish that we catch. And we started doing this when we began the fishing contest, when we recruited the public to help us to essentially be part of the management solution to protect native fish and said, come help us through harvest of these fish. We didn't want to then say, well, we're just going to dump the fish you give us. We wanted to process them and donate them to food banks. And there's a lot of things that motivate these anglers to help. One, of course, is money. We put about $300,000 in prize money to these contests annually. And another is they like that these fish go to food banks. So it's just another reward for them. In the time we've worked, we estimate about 80 tons of fish have gone to food banks. But as we reached that point where even the contests weren't enough and we needed a gill net, and our costs kept going up, then we realized we need to offset these costs somehow. And here are the fillets coming out of our fillet machine. So we have a really um, top shelf kind of processing facility. And I'd like to make a quick contrast here that uh, this is a lionfish. And it seems to present a similar problem and solution as to what we're doing. It's invaded the Caribbean, of course. And they, like so many others dealing with this problem, and I'm sure you're familiar with many of these applications, are attempting essentially that if you can't beat them, eat them type solution. So they're trying to do the same thing there. That's what we're trying to do. And after we began gill netting, with our costs escalating and wanting to recover some of those costs and make lake trout pay for themselves, <clears throat> we formed a corporation and now we're selling lake trout and our bycatch of lake whitefish. This is the label we put on our product and it, it illustrates what we try to emphasize that when you consume this product, you're contributing to conservation. It's wild caught native caught and um, fresh. We pride ourselves in the fact that it's typically less than four hours from the water to the freezer. Here's the final product. And this is the proud crew that generates them. And from there they go into boxes to be shipped out to distributors. So clearly this is a lot of work and it's work that has to go on indefinitely. And it's the best solution we could come up with. We wish we had a silver bullet here, we don't. And to maintain these important species, cutthroat trout and, and bull trout, <clears throat> this is what we have to do and this is what we're committed to doing over the long term. We have early indications that we're succeeding in re reducing lake trout abundance. We're waiting for some hard numbers to show response in native fish, but we really don't have those yet. But we're pretty confident and optimistic over the long term that we will see that. Thank you.